your words can sink you, synchronize, or they can sink you. That's from James chapter 3, verse 2. And the little line underneath it is part of the verse. It says, I summarize it. It says, rule your tongue and you'll rule your body. So we all know the power of our words. Life and death is in our tongue, right? Death and life in the power of our tongue. Choose life. Careful what you say. And we don't want to be hung up and all legalistic about this. You have to be really careful that you don't get weird. Sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it real. You want to make sure the fountain of your heart is pure before the Lord. Think of the example Jesus gave with the trees. He said, your outward actions are based on the fruit of your, on the roots of your life. Excuse me. Your outward actions are like the fruit on the tree. And the cause of those actions is based in the roots of your life. So if you don't like the fruit, if you've got some bad fruit coming off, you can do something about it. You can get to the roots of that thing. And what comes out of your mouth starts somewhere in the root system of your life. Not just what you know, but what you believe. It's a big difference to know something and to believe it enough to actually do it. Can I stay here for a second? My father smoked two packs of Pall Mall cigarettes a day for 45 years from the way I heard it. They didn't have a filter on them. And he was a diesel mechanic, and he had to fix the trucks of our family business in a closed garage. So he was breathing all this diesel smoke and smoking cigarettes on top. Like, man, I must have some strong relatives. So he lasted as long as he did. And we would say, Dad, we're concerned about your health, man. Don't you think you should quit smoking? See, he knew up here that he should quit, but he didn't believe it enough to actually stop. Then he had a heart attack. And he was laid out on the floor at our house, and I won't go into details, but he died. And then came back to life. And those of you that know anything about medicine, you know that if somebody discharges, they died. That sphincter valve opens up. That's as gross as I'm going to get right now. But he was gone, and he came back. He never smoked another cigarette after that, I'm just saying. See, he went from knowing to believing. <laughs> I don't want to wait till I have a heart attack to change my behavior. In Jesus' name, I'm not speaking that over myself. So I'm, I'm going to kind of just go through some verses quickly and then a couple of examples. So this is the verse that I quoted, James 3 in the Amplified. And the way to remember it is just synchronizing your words. It's what you say. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth will speak. The heart has the roots. So guard your heart. For out of it flow the issues of life. Our words really matter. And with this cancel culture, more than ever, your words really matter. And it doesn't mean just stay locked down and don't talk. It means measure it. Be Rule over your spirit. Right? It says in Proverbs, when you can rule over your spirit, you have defenses. But a person who doesn't rule their spirit, and with words it could be because you get emotionally hijacked and your temper flares, now all of a sudden you're not ruling your spirit. That gorilla got out of the cage, and he's making some noise. And you're going to regret what you say when he's in charge, right? Keep the cockpit door locked. Don't let him in. See? Walk away. Don't allow yourself to be hijacked. It doesn't mean you can't be firm with people. You speak the truth, but you do it in love. So James said, we all stumble and sin in many ways. Anybody want to say amen? amen? That's not one of those big amen lines, but I ask. We all stumble and sin in many ways. If anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, never saying the wrong thing, then he's a perfect man or a perfect woman. And that's, that doesn't mean flawless. It means mature. It means measured. It means you've gone through training, like in our Air Force, when you sign up to be a pilot, you don't just get the keys to the plane. you got to go through training. You have to pass a bunch of tests, right? So we do too. Why would it be any different? You think God is just flip about who stands up here and speaks to you? No, because the church is vulnerable. And, and he, you know, the people up here better be tested and tried beforehand or else the people get hurt. And he loves you too much for you to want to get hurt. 
all right, perfect man. Well, okay, fully developed in character, without serious flaws, able to bridle his whole body and reign in his entire nature, taming his human faults and weaknesses. Wow. That's one verse in the Amplified. <laughs> James 3.2. This is the word in the Greek. It's called teleos, which is derived from telos. Anybody ever heard that word, telos? What it means, you'll, you'll hear philosophers talk about it, and I don't mean that in some... Uh, like ethereal, academic way. Philosophy is, everybody has a philosophy. You've got a worldview in your life, right? That's what that means. Tell us is, what are you aiming at? What does a good day look for you? Look like for you, I should say. Well, a lot of us are aiming too low. Okay, now we should say, I want to make sure when I die, I go to heaven. Yes, for sure. That's a good aim. But what about, I want to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. That's a really good tell us. That's a good aim to be shooting at. And the more I can't rule my mouth, the less likely it is that I'm going to hit that aim. Because he never sinned. And he was even angry. Because some people think anger is a sin. It's not a sin. But boy, it's close. <laughs> For a lot of us, you could sin pretty easily. He was angry and never sinned. So it's possible to do it within the container of Holy Spirit wisdom, but it's not easy, is it, church? Let's just be real. It's not easy. So consummated goal is tell us. And listen, if we all just got real honest with each other, we have a goal every day when we wake up. God's saying, aim higher. Aim for Christ. He's the role model that you want to be like. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, we are being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. Yeah. That's not a bad mission statement for you right there, every day. And you can hold each other accountable. My wife and I can, can say, I love you. And because I love you, I just don't think that was aiming at Christ right there. I think the gorilla, she would say to me, got out of the cage. And, and that wasn't, you know, an, an A plus to be like Jesus. Maybe not an F. Maybe it was an F. But, you know, we have a no-cut contract, so we're stuck together like glue. 37 years. Mature from going through the necessary stages. Oh, man. I have to go through necessary stages to reach the end goal. Developed into completion by fulfilling the necessary process. Oh, that's weird. Nobody likes it. I got saved. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm going to heaven. That's all. Not. No. That's not all. You're going to be an ambassador for the kingdom. And the more you're like Jesus, the more effective you're going to be. We've had so many people in the last few weeks here. We were in New York City. We did an outreach in Times Square. It was amazing. And, and people were witnessing on the street, leading people to the Lord. We said Wednesday night our drummer got healed at, at a different event that was going on. And, and when you're out on the street and you're seeing God move, you don't ever want to go back to boring, mediocre Christianity. Because you want to be used by God while you're here. You have a window of time while you're here. And then it says about David, he served his generation during his time, and then he was called home. Well, we're here now to serve our generation in this time. And everybody's gift is different. But we want you all to flourish in your gifting. Glad you said amen to that. <laughs> And then the, uh, the, this dictionary I looked at said, think of this telescope that the sailors used to use back in the old days, remember? And he said, this idea is well illustrated with the old sailor's telescope of unfolding and extending out one stage at a time until it functions at full strength. So all four of those cylinders got to click into place before you can focus. All right? So don't, don't hate the journey of, of maturing in Christ. It's an amazing journey. It gets better. But this, this was a song. I, I'm, as a musician, a lot of times the Lord will remind me of old songs. And in 1970, believe me when I say this is not what I'm aiming for, okay? But I don't know if you can read it. It's kind of small. But it says, Ball of Confusion. It's a song by the Temptations. And it just so fits today. And look, you know, the lyrics are a little complicated. Segregation, determination, demonstration, integration. Aggravation, humiliation, obligation to our nation. Ball of confusion. Anybody remember? Oh, yeah, that's what the world is today. It's a, you know, don't, it's not a Christian song, but I'm just saying, the world is a ball of confusion today. All right? So if ever they need to hear the truth, tell us, aim at Jesus, it's today. And then there's this great line, oh, great Googaluga. 
Can you hear me talking to you? It's just a ball of confusion. That's what the world is. Then end, I'm sorry, eve of destruction, tax deduction, city inspection, bill collectors, mod clothes in demand, population out of hand, suicide, too many bills, hippies moving to the hills. It was 1970. The war was still going on. People all over the world shouting, end the war. Man, ball of confusion. Where's the shelter in that storm? Jesus Christ. That's the shelter. My firm foundation. I built my life on Jesus. We sang it. I sing it forever, that song. I love that song. Because it's just true, but it, it just rings true in your heart. No matter how confusing it gets, my compass stays pointed to true north of God. So I just uh, t taught a class for Tricia um, on Wednesday because she was traveling at a meeting that she was speaking at and a part of, and in the, at the end of the class, people said, well, can you put a, a playlist of worship songs together? Because in our morning devotions, we want to be able to do what you're asking us to do in, in the class. So I did that, and, and you can go on there now too, and I'll just also make a, a little quick commercial here. I don't see it. Oh, you took the book. We're still going to be married after this. It's okay. So Trisha found this great book called Winning the War in Your Mind. So we highly recommend that. Um, but only on chapter three, if you want to dial in, you can come in on, uh, on Thursday, mo I'm sorry, Wednesday mornings at 10, and, and you can be part of that. But what I also did, which don't come up and get them now, but I printed out some things. These are the scriptures that this man uses in the first part of the book. Because if you want to cancel lies, right, that's what it says, you're winning the war in your mind, then you need the truth to count, cancel the lies. And this ties in with a vision that I have that I'm going to share with you. But I just wanted to just say what I wrote on this playlist. Every morning, kneel and still your heart before God. Commune with God your Father. Take communion in remembrance of Jesus. You could do that in your house. You could take communion in your house. You don't have to be in church to do that. Hand the keys of your life to Holy Spirit. Boy, this is a hard one, isn't it? All right, I'll hand you the keys. I'm meditating on God's word. I'm singing of God's goodness. And don't take back the keys. All right? Make that determination that no matter what goes on today, I'm letting you stay in charge. I'm not going to get hijacked by my emotions. So avail yourself of these resources. If these are all gone, don't worry. We can email it to you as a PDF. No, no problem. We want to equip you. There was a man who spoke here, Steve Backlund and his wife, Wendy. It was a phenomenal meeting. I just took a two-minute clip from, from what he said when he was here because he says it so well. I, th I thought we could just hear it right from the source, and, and Ray's going to do that. She wrote a great book, which uh, is another book that Trisha has, has used in the past about our emotions. Good to go, Ray? I'm going to show you how to get that heaviness off you. It's not by doing something different, it's by believing something different. A little louder. My wife wrote a book called Victorious Emotions, and she very succinctly says, if you want a different emotion, you need a different belief. And we found this out. Surrendering our beliefs is more challenging often than surrendering our heart. The Lord asked Wendy, can you surrender the beliefs that you're shy? inadequate and can't speak well in front of others can you surrender those beliefs <clears throat> and she says but that's who i am haha <laughs> and she hears this that's not who you are it's just who you've become that's not who you are the only reason because what we what we realized is that we renewed our minds more with our past experience and our feelings than what he was saying. Because mind renewal on one level is just whatever you come into agreement with. I agree I'm not powerful. I agree I'm shy. I agree I don't have the gift of healing. And, and, and what happens is that we, because current mind renewal creates future experience. Whatever I renew my mind with today will transform by tomorrow. He, he asked me, Steve, can you, can you surrender the beliefs that you're less than other leaders 
And can you surrender the belief that there's something uniquely wrong with you? Let's laugh at that lie, by the way. Ha <laughs> ha. Ha ha. Can you say, well, Lord, it feels so true. There's something uniquely wrong with me. If it feels this true, does it mean it is true? He said, no. Feelings don't validate truth. They just validate what you believe to be true. Selah. <laughs> so this is what he said. Wendy wrote a book called Victorious Emotions, and she succinctly said, if you want a different emotion, you need a different belief. <laughs> Man, that's good truth. I tell you, when I had this vision that I'm going to tell you about, it was this came back up in my spirit because even though he's not as well known out here, he's a profound, great, gifted teacher. And, and part of the ministry is let's laugh at that. He said it a little bit there. Like, that's such a blatant lie, devil. I'm laughing at you. But you think you can get me to believe that. And then we found that surrendering our beliefs is more challenging than surrendering our heart. Because <laughs> she had said to the Lord, I surrender my heart, just take it. And, and the Lord said back to her, I already have your heart. I need your beliefs, <laughs> which is in your mind. And that's why we need to, the renewal of our mind. Amen? And God said, can you surrender the belief that you're shy? And she said, no, but that's who I am. And the answer was great, right? But was she sinking her mind with heaven at that point? Or was she sinking into what the world said about her? You see the difference? You can synchronize your words with heaven if you're listening and you're connected with heaven. But, oh, no, that's just who I am. I'm just shy by my nature and a leopard can't change his spots. Like, you know, like there's all these lame things that people say. You're a new creation in Christ, and you go from the milk to the meat. You mature. You go through a process of transformation. And Jesus wasn't being discouraging when he said, a bad root can't produce good fruit. It's like, no, you can change your roots. And all that bad fruit can just die off and go away. And once there's a good root, you're not going to want to go back to the bad root anymore. Because good fruit tastes a whole lot better. That's not who you are, God said. That's what you've become. And that kind of ties into what I'm going to tell you about what I saw. Jesus asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he says, Who do you say that I am? And then my namesake, Peter, always seemed to be ready with a word. Doesn't mean it was always right. <laughs> Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It didn't take Peter any time to give that answer, it would appear. He knew who Jesus was, and he was following Jesus because he believed what he said right here. No hesitation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus went on to tell him, you know, that flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My father showed you that. So he knew it at a deeper part than just Knowing it up here as a fact, he believed it in his heart. Big difference. So then God said to Steve in that little clip we saw, can you surrender the belief that there's something uniquely wrong with you? Anybody else ever had that feeling? Uh, can we just be a little more honest and raise our hands up a little higher? Okay. We're getting rid of the shame. Shame off you. Shame off you. You're a new creation. He makes all things new. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb and takes off all those stinky grave clothes. Didn't even stink by the time he got there. So Steve said, but Lord, it feels so true that something's uniquely wrong with me. Is that sinking my thoughts with heaven or sinking into what the world would say, spiritual poverty? And you don't want spiritual poverty on you. And you're in control of how, how rich or, or poor you are in the spirit. Because you control that. It's right here in your heart. Guard your heart. Out of it flow the issues of life. But if it feels true, doesn't that mean it's true, God? And what God's going to say, no, you don't walk by your feelings. You walk by faith, not by sight. If it feels true, doesn't that mean it's true? That's another lie. Whoever said this? People in the world say it all the time. Oh, just trust your heart. But the Bible says man's heart is deceitfully wicked. So you need to only trust your redeemed heart when you know it's lined up with God. Amen? 
God said, no, feelings don't validate the truth. They only validate what you believe to be true. And boy, we can get some work done on that. So Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter could have said to Jesus, Jesus, who do you say that I am? And we should all be saying that right now because that's the answer we want. It's what he says. We sing that other song too. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Wow, man, that's so powerful. And if, if what somebody else is saying to me is different than what God says about me, I have to cho always choose what God says. Because people will speak word curses over you without even knowing that that's what they're doing. Your words will either synchronize you with God or sink you into soul poverty. This is on us, and we can control it. It takes a little effort and work, and you've got to break some old habits. You've got, like, the wrong kind of muscle memory about what's coming out of your mouth. So in Psalm 1, this is the voice version. It says, God's blessings follow you and await you at every turn. You know it as, blessed be the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's a very famous part of Scripture, right? But I like the way the voice says it. God's blessings follow you and await you at every turn when you don't follow the advice of people who delight in wicked schemes. So it's not just an automatic thing that these blessings are just going to follow you. It's when you are lined up and your thinking is lined up with heaven. And he's never slumbering or sleeping. You can always call him and talk to him. 24-hour hotline. Toll-free number. Bandwidth is always on. <laughs> when you don't follow the advice of people who delight in wicked schemes. When you avoid sin's highway. I like that one. When judgment and sarcasm beckon you, but you refuse judgment and scarcasm. <laughs> For you, the eternal's word is your happiness. It's your focus from dusk till dawn. You're like a tree planted by flowing cool streams of water that never run dry. Your fruit ripens in its time and your leaves never fade or curl in the summer sun. Boy, that's a good picture, isn't it? Yeah, I'm alive. And then Joshua, you all know this, this is a memory verse for a lot of people. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth. Words, your mouth, what are you saying? Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it. For then you will prosper. Okay? That makes so much sense. Like any parent knows when you're disciplining your children, they don't just get to do whatever they want to do. The blessing is in obedience, not rebellion. This is another thing I talked about Wednesday. It's um, just a, a powerful tool that I use every day. When Ray, um, I saw Ray today, he walked in when we were getting ready for the service, and he, he heard this on in my back pocket, because whenever I have a chance, I'm just running the word of God in the background while I'm doing other things. And how long do you think it takes to get through the, all the books of the New Testament at normal speed? Because this is New Jersey. You might try to speed it up. 22 hours. All right? You can get through the whole New Testament in 22 hours at normal speed. And there's plenty of things you do during the course of the week that you could have other things going on in the background and be filling your mind with the Word and not some other podcast on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff out there. But the more I listen to the word, the less I like the stuff on the podcast because it doesn't compare. The podcast is not eternal. Now, I do have to know the news for my job, right? So I, I can't ignore it. But when I don't have to look at that, this is what's calling me. He gives me the desires of my heart. He places his thoughts in me and then I want what he wants. You all know that verse? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I think that means he will take his desires from heaven and put them in your heart so you will want what he wants for you. Only 68 hours for the Old Testament. Figured I'd give you the shorter one first. It's all good, man. It's all good. And this is like a, a dramatized version, which actually helps. It really does. There's different voices coming on for men and women. And, you know, it's not just like a droning, boring thing. I, I'm, I love it. I'm, I'm doing it all the time. And if you are an Audible member, you just... Get the whole thing for one credit. It's amazing. All right, so let me just give you the vision that I had. We were in Gloria Zion, and we were, the worship was going on, and, and I don't normally see as many visions when I'm here as I am when I'm down there. It's just something about the atmosphere down there. But this is what I saw, uh, a vault up in heaven. And I'll, 
I'll tell you the story as it unfolds, but this verse is really important. Isaiah 44, 22. This is a people plundered and pillaged. All of them are trapped in caves or are hidden away in prisons. They become plunder. Now, I'm just going to say, for today's headlines, this is pretty accurate for a lot of people. The children are being told lies in school about their identity. And our tax dollars are being used to fund that. I'm sorry. There is a biological difference between a man and a woman. Anybody home? Is the mic on? An infant knows there's a difference between a man and a woman. And they're trying to just, I guess, if you say the lie enough, they think you're going to believe it. No, we know the truth. Come on. They're trapped. They're plundered and pillaged. And all of them are trapped in caves or hidden away in prisons. They become plunder with no one to save them and spoils with no one to say give them back. So I just want to be careful here, Ray, that I get this right because I haven't done it before. So then this is what I saw, like overlaid over the safe was frequency coming from the glory of Zion meeting that we were in. And this vault that was up in heaven was not the riches of God that we want. It was the lies of God's people that they were believing. And there was no way to crack that thing open. But if you think about how glass can shatter with the right frequency, that's the image here, is that as we rose up with our frequency as a group of people, you know, like you could picture the image of it moving, the, the frequency was pounding away at the lock. And there's power in that, isn't it? There's power that you don't see it, you don't see it opening right away, but the more we do it and the more we get on God's frequency and we're lining our thoughts up with him and our words up with him, there's something going on in the spirit. You could be witnessing to somebody, and this could be going on. Their heart is closed, but the Lord speaks a prophetic word to you and gives you a word in season, and boom, that vault just opens up. I'm getting there, Ray. Hang in there, brother. <laughs> so now, I think I spoke too soon. <laughs> Here, Here's what it looked like when the frequency hit. The lock was broken open, and all of these lies came tumbling out. See, it looks like treasure here, but it's the currency of the enemy's kingdom, not our kingdom. And every kingdom has currency. And the currency of God's kingdom is truth that causes people's lives to change. Not just truth up on a stone wall somewhere. He said... Blessed is the one who not only hears what I say, but does what I say. Go make disciples. Why are you mad, Pastor? You're yelling. <laughs> so I said it. It's the currency of the enemy's kingdom, and it's the lies that we believe about ourselves. But then after that, I saw this, which was a, a forgery. You know, a forge, not fake, a forge that took the enemy's lies and boiled it down and created new currency for us. Okay? So when that frequency hits that target and those lies get emptied out, now you have to do something with it because you have to renew your mind with the truth of the word, right? Renew your mind with the truth of the word. Ha! Huh. Romans 12, 1 says, offer your lives as a living sacrifice, and then do not be transformed to the ways of this world, but renew your mind with the truth. And that's what we do. And then he gives us kingdom currency, and there's a great Bible uh, reference to this, which I think I'm going to get it. There it is. Luke 11, 21 and 22 says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are at peace. That's what happens when you believe a lie. That's what those two people were talking about. Wendy, I'm just shy. This is who I am. And then Steve, you know, there's something uniquely wrong with me. I have a problem that nobody else in the history of the world ever had, and there's no solution. That's what he was believing, and he was a pastor of a church. And sometimes a church will do that to you. And, and instead of trying to build you up and, and bless you, it's like, Shame off you. That's all I'm going to say. Shame off you. If anybody should be trying to encourage you to aim higher towards that telos, it's here. What were you designed for, Gregory? Like, who did God make you to be? 
No, no other person like you in the whole world. And your wife was really smart to marry you. Let's see. <laughs> Hold up. Come on. We got to just think about this. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are at peace. And then there's this big B-U-T. But when a stronger one than he comes upon him, he overcomes him and takes from him all the armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So stand up with me for a minute here. Let's do an exercise and lift your hand up and just say to the Lord, show me the vault in heaven. Well, it's the second heaven. It's not God's third heaven. It's that, it's that where the principalities and powers are in that second heaven that's holding the lies that I believe. Now, you got to do that. Think about it. What are you holding on to that's a lie that you're believing and the Holy Spirit will show you? Because, Jesus, you are the stronger than the strong man. You, the frequency out of coming out of my life is going to crack that vault open, and those lies are going to come tumbling out, and you're going to melt that down and recreate it, and what the devil meant for evil, you're going to turn it to good. What Joseph's brothers meant for death, you turned it around and made it life. And you save them through a wicked act that they did. So there's nothing that God can't do. He can turn around any situation. And we say the currency of the kingdom is the truth of the word of God that causes change in our lives. All right, stay standing for a minute because uh, we're going to be involved here a little bit. Let's, let's just think about what we read and then pray into it for a minute. You guys good with this? I'm really not giving you any options, but uh, trying to make it look good. So think about what I say, and then let's pray for a minute. God chose us to be in relationship with him even before he laid out the plans for this world. Ephesians 1, 4. Do you believe that? Do you believe before the foundation of the world, God knew you would be here and that he wanted a personal relationship with you? Oh, but Lord, there's something uniquely wrong with me. Well, did he say anything about that? No, it's not judged by anything other than he loves you. And the unconditional love of God cracks through like that frequency that opens that vault of lies. So, Lord, that's what you pray now. Lord, in any way that I don't believe you want to be in personal relationship with me, I ask you to take that lie out of my life right now. Cause me to awaken to the truth of your word that I have believed a lie that I'm less than, that I'm not who you say that I am. You could say it out loud if you want. It's legal in this church. He wanted us to live holy lives characterized by love, free from sin, and blameless before him. That's his telos. That's the goal. That's what we're shooting for, blameless before him, characterized by love, free from sin. He destined us to be adopted as his children. Now, wait a minute. If you believe this, you're not going to fall for the false identities that the world is trying to give you because there's a spirit of adoption that cries out, Abba, Father. Come on, by faith, just lift up your arms and say, Lord, break open that vault. Take that lie out of that vault that I'm not loved by my Father, that God is like my earthly Father. No, He's not. No, He's not. God is a perfect Father, and the spirit of adoption cries out, Abba, Father, Lord, and by faith, by faith we receive that love. By faith we believe and receive that we are loved by you. And that the word of God is true. He destined us to be adopted as his children through the covenant. Jesus the anointed inaugurated in his sacrificial life. If you need a reason to praise God, there's a good one. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and voluntarily submitted your life. And when he stood before Pilate, Pilate said, don't you know that I could take your life from you right now? Jesus said, you can't take anything. Nothing. You can't take anything. I voluntarily lay my life down because I love Trisha Festa in Patterson, New Jersey. And then Peter loved Trisha Festa in Patterson, New Jersey. My God. We really better get a hold of this one because if you're believing a lie, that will cancel the power of the truth. You got to know, you got to know that you believe it because it's true. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that for that plan that you have for me. His pleasure and his will is for us 
That's what he wants. He wants us to prosper. Ephesians 2, you're no longer called outcasts and drug addicts and wanderers and lowlifes and liars and, and the things that the drugs would make people do. That, that was identified by the devil and he accuses you and says, that's who you are. And you say, no, that's who I was. That's not who I am now. I am who God says I am now. And that's a lie, sa Satan. That's only who I was. That's not who I am now. No more outcasts and wanderers, but citizens of God's people, members of God's holy family, residents of his household, so that I'm being laid. Peter Roselli is being laid on a solid foundation with Jesus the anointed as the cornerstone. Man, oh, you talk about a firm foundation. Sorry. The creator of the universe is our firm foundation. Before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. I was with the Father in heaven. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Woo! In the beginning. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm being built on that foundation. The building is joined together stone by stone. Welcome back, David and Adriel, too. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to welcome them back from Jordan. That's a stone in the, in the wall. They went to Jordan and they saw miracle signs and wonders over there. They're never gonna be the same after experiencing that. Each one of us, we, we don't value each other enough. Stone by stone, this building is coming together. All of us chosen and sealed in him, rising up to become a holy temple in the Lord. What a picture that is. Say, Lord, make me a spiritual temple. I want to be one of those stones in your building, Lord. I know I'm not perfect, but you used Nehemiah to take the burnt stones and rebuild Jerusalem. So no matter what my past looks like, it doesn't matter to you. I'm telling you, sometimes it's a better thing because you know what it's like to be in that pit. And when God brings you to the other side, you have authority to help other people get out of that mess. In him, me and David are being built together creating a sacred dwelling place among where God can live in the spirit, his faithfulness. Lord, your faithfulness to your father made it possible for us to have the courage that we need and the ability to approach our father confidently. Come on, just say it by faith. I will approach my father in heaven confidently, not for what I have done, but what for Jesus has done for me. I don't want less than the best of what you want for me, Lord. Yeah. Speak it out of your mouth. Align your words. Synchronize your words with heaven, not sink it into spiritual poverty with the words that we use that, that defile us. We, we repeat curses that other people spoke over us because we believe that we're defiling ourselves. Lord, give us the awareness to wake up to that and not say anything about ourselves that you don't say, that's not in agreement. And then this is a prayer that Paul prays in, in Ephesians 3. Say it out loud with me, okay? Father, out of your honorable and glorious riches, strengthen your people. Fill their souls with the power of your spirit so that through faith, the anointed one will reside in their hearts. May love be the rich soil where their lives take root. May it be the bedrock where their lives are found. Now meditate on that for a minute. Come on, he was praying for you. And we're all praying for each other that this is gonna be a rich ecosystem for the life of God, not corrupted by the, by the thoughts of the world creeping in. Lord, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And Jesus prayed, he said, Lord, uh, Father, I pray for them, not that you would take them out of the world, but that they would be kept from the evil one and that they would be a weapon, right? You're a weapon in the hand of God to destroy the works of the devil. But we receive this word. You will, you will strengthen your people. You will fill our souls with the power of your spirit. And by faith, the anointed one, Jesus, will reside in my heart. May love be the rich soil where my life takes root and a bedrock where my life is founded. You got a little left in you? Come on, we're almost done. Come on, say it. So that together with all your people, they will have the power to understand that the love of the anointed is infinitely long, wide, high, and deep. Think about it. Just think about it. What's too hard for God? 
But maybe that there's a lie in you that's still in that vault that is believing that, not by what you say or, or what you say you believe, but, but by your actions. It might not be proven that you believe it. So when you have, let's just say as an example, a prodigal child and you're believing for them to come home, set a place at the table for them, even though they're in another state, because it shows that you believe they're coming back, right? I'm not saying religious, mechanistic, I'm just saying my actions should agree with what I say I believe. And I'm believing he's coming back, so there's a place at the table, at the dinner table for him or her. Surpassing everything anyone ever previously experienced. God, may your fullness flood through the entire being of each and every one of us. This is the last one, okay? You good? May God, sorry, God, may your fullness flood through their entire beings. Go ahead, ask that. Lord, may your goodness flow through my entire being. Let it be like a CAT scan in the spirit that anywhere there's a, there's a, a cancerous, precancerous cell of thinking that you will reveal it and it will be flushed out of our system. That my immune system will strengthen as I memorize your word, as I spend more time with you, as I turn away from the things of the world. I will be strengthened in you, Lord. And that, that will help me to do what James said. Watch what comes out of my mouth. Now to the God who can do so many awe-inspiring, immeasurable things, things greater than we could ever ask or imagine through the power that work in us, to him be all glory in the church and in Jesus from this generation to the next forever and ever. Okay. Just pray in the spirit for a minute, would you? Kasende kilo kosoto raba kashanda raba kesata kisoto rolo kushate kidere. Thank you, Lord. You are for us. You are not against us. You are for us. We have a blessing on our lives. You have a, put a blessing on our lives, and we receive that blessing and the awareness and the awakening to come against every one of those lies that we've been in agreement with. Exceedingly abundantly above what we could ask or imagine. That's who you are. I bless your people right now, Lord. I thank you that they are doing generation to generation. That those of us that are here, the things that we've learned, we will pass it down to people that are younger than us that we will have it in mind as a good family does, that we take care of one another, that we have each other's back, and that we love one another, not just in word, but in deed and in action. I bless your people as they go, Lord. I speak that blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. Make his face shine upon you. Cause his favor to rest on your life. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going. That his favor would be with you wherever you go. I know today was a little bit of a truncated service. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for your faithfulness for being here with us. Raise your hand. Let me just speak that over you. Lord, as, as we leave here today, we say we go with your power operating in us. And open our minds and our eyes to hear and see what you want to say to us today. And everybody said... Amen.